Good morning and welcome to today's Nursing Now webinar, which is entitled, What Can We Learn From History? As you will know, the history of nursing is intertwined with the history of gender, race, politics, economics, quality and health. And as the profession is rapidly growing and evolving around the world, we are asking today, what can we learn from the past and the legacy of pioneering nurses who forged the path of the profession today? So my name is Steve Ford and I'm the editor of Nursing Times. Thank you very much to Nursing Now for inviting me to chair this event. So Nursing Now was set up three years ago to uh, raise the status of nurses around the world, culminating in 2020, the International Year of the Nurse and Midwife. It is run in collaboration with, uh, with the World Health Organization, the International Council of Nurses and the Burdett Trust of Nursing. Uh, sorry, Burdett Trust for Nursing. Um, so thanks again to them for inviting me. As I said, today we're going to try and reflect on what we can learn from history's leading nurses and how we can use their experiences and lessons to influence the future of the nursing profession. Specifically, we're going to consider the importance of legacy in the development of the profession, reflect on the lessons of the lived experiences of some pioneering nurses, uh, sorry, <coughs> nurses, and also look at why museums are important in all of this. So at this point, I'm delighted to welcome our esteemed panel of speakers who will be talking to us this morning. We're very lucky to have with us Dame Anne-Marie Rafferty, Professor of Nursing Policy at the Florence Nightingale Faculty of Nursing and Midwifery at King's College London and President of the RCN. What she doesn't know about nursing history isn't worth knowing in my book. We also have David Green, Director of the world famous Florence Nightingale Museum, which particularly needs our support this year, and Greta Restwood, Chief Executive of the Florence Nightingale Foundation. Now, both of these organisations, of course, have been marking the 200th anniversary of the birth of Florence Nightingale as best they can um, in the face of the challenge presented by COVID-19. So now before I invite them to speak, just a few more words from me. Firstly, again, I'd like to thank Nursing Now for supporting the Nursing Times COVID-19 Are You OK campaign. Uh, so this is something we set up earlier this year to raise awareness of the mental health pressures and needs of nurses during and after the coronavirus pandemic. We're now in the next phase of the campaign, which involves actively asking employers from the health and care sector to back the aims of the campaign. And we're inviting organisations like Nursing Now to become supporters of the campaign. So thanks once again to them. Anyone interested in getting involved, visit the Nursing Times website for more details. Similar to this event being hosted today by Nursing Now, Nursing Times has converted its annual portfolio of events into a virtual format. In the last month or two has been quite busy. Um, we've squeezed all of our awards and conferences into uh, the virtual format, like I said. And in fact, we finished our last major event last Thursday, which is the Nursing Times Workforce Summit and Awards. Running through them all has been the theme um, to discuss the challenges and innovation that this year has created and to highlight and celebrate the incredible work of nurses in every setting and specialty. And we aim to do this every year, of course, but in 2020, it feels doubly important. Let's not forget, it is still the International Year of the Nurse and Midwife, which is set to be extended like the Nursing Now initiative. And COVID-19 will surely go down in the history of nursing as a key year for the profession. And that's something I'm sure we'll discuss um, as we get on today. So as Nursing Now's Executive Director Barbara Stilwell says in the December issue of Nursing Times, we wanted to raise the status and profile of nurses. And ironically, we've seen the status and profile being raised incredibly years this year because of the pandemic. Barbara was, of course, speaking specifically about Nursing Now, but I think it's equally true of the Year of the Nurse and other, ce other celebrations surrounding the ni uh, Nightingale Bicentenary. Now, naturally, we want this webinar to be as much of an interactive experience as possible, so please ask any questions that you have, and I'll put them to the panel. Um, basically, don't be shy. Um, you basically put them in, in the chat box um, on Zoom, which you should be able to see. Um, so thanks very much for listening to me, and now let's get down to business. I'd like to welcome our first speaker, Dame Anne-Marie Rafferty. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Steve, and to the organisers for inviting me here today. Um, I'm hoping that people can 
see my slides. Is that the case? Uh, might take no. a couple of seconds. Let, Hang on. Let me let me just let me just go. There we go. Okay, Brill. Let me start at the beginning up here. Yeah. Um, so thank you to the organisers for inviting me. I'm really excited to be sharing some uh, reflections on the topics and themes that, that Steve so ably outlined. Um, I think maybe we, we could put a question mark, you know, behind that phrase, lessons from history can and do we learn le lessons from history? And I think it was the, the, uh, the, the sceptical um, Georg uh, Hegel who was a great hero of Karl Marx, who basically said that, that it's not so much that we, we, we can't learn from history, it's just that it's quite difficult uh, to do so, and that sometimes we, we, we don't for a whole variety of reasons. Some people don't listen, they don't want to learn, they don't like what they hear. So uh, not, not learning from history is quite a complicated set of equations and, and interactions. But just a few words um, really on why, do, why should we bother studying history in the first place? I mean, uh, as I think the phrase was put in the webinar, and I think it, it's, it's referring more to David's talk, you know, what's in it for me? Um, well, you know, people don't, generally speaking, have, have some of those, those motives if they are driven by sheer intellectual pleasure and curiosity. And I think we've got to accept that that should be one of the major um, driving forces of behind studying history. Not always to have, as we do in, in, in education these days, there has to be an application, there has to be some kind of didactic purpose and end. But just do it for its own sake, you know, because it's fun and it's fascinating. Um, secondly, and I think this is uh, where history has often found its uh, positioning in nursing uh, and in other uh, spheres of, um, you know, policy uh, activity. It's it's and and in social movements more generally. And I'll say a few more words about that. It is part of a kind of raising consciousness um, activity. And certainly uh, for many, it's an intrinsic and integral part of their political education. Uh, apartheid movement, for example, uh, was you know, predicated on understanding the, the, the history of, of, of Africa, the history of colonization. Um, Similarly, the civil rights movement wouldn't be anything but for its history, and, and history provided a really important interpretive kind of thrust and propulsive power to help uh, educate uh, not just, just the leaders and the activists, but those who were uh, engaged in the civil rights movement. So political education is very important as one of as history as a vehicle of that. Understanding, you know, the dynamics of change and, and human agency, how we can act upon the world and be effective in it. History is a great guide to that. And I certainly found it very useful in understanding policy and some of the conditions under which policy itself can be formulated. And then occasionally, you know, demystifying and demythologizing the past and the particularly icons. And of course, our great heroine of the Crimea, Florence Nightingale, has had a fair share, some may say an unfair share, of uh, demythologizing and, and demystifying. And I think, you know, there's been many excellent books and research, and notably Lynn MacDonald's 16 volume uh, collected works and Mark Bostridge's magisterial biography of Nightingale demonstrate just what a towering, titanic figure she is in, in, our, in, in the canon. Of nursing, but not just there. Of course, she's hailed as a heroine by others um, from Royal Statistical Science Society, where she was uh, the first female, the first woman member. And her Steve talking about in, innovation and invention. A number of you will be very familiar with the fact that she innovated the early techniques of data visualization, which are still highly relevant today and I think that's part of her legacy and something that I think we should take forward. How are we going to innovate in presenting nursing data, the use that we make of nursing data, what kind of data is actually available in systems 
to enable nurses to kind of drive quality if effectively. And I mean, she was also very interested. She's a woman of many parts in administrative data systems, using those as a vehicle to compare hospital performance, not just uh, within countries, but internationally. And she advocated a standardized system for doing so. And you will not, you will be familiar with the debates on mortality rates in COVID at the moment. You know, where people are arguing, you can't really compare like with like because we collect the data in slightly different ways. And maybe if Nightingale had had her way, that would have been an easier kind of task than currently now. Her notes in nursing courses celebrated um, for being the first place where hand hygiene was 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 actually mentioned, and that's now such a kind of, you know, core uh, part of our, our preventive action against against COVID itself, as well as being beautifully written and, and wrought um, piece of literature. Um, and I mean, the, the, just the point I was making about icons, the, the sort of hagiographic hey approach, elevating people onto pedestals, and then other historians come along and they love taking kind of pop shots and shooting down people you know, it's not their fault that someone puts them on a pedestal or a, or a kind of plinth. Um, and, and, and somehow these kind of personality traits get ascribed and attributed to, to our, our, our sort of heroic characters. And so within the Nightingale historiography, you know, we see these battles being played out with F.B. Smith sort of calling, you know, really referring to Nightingale negative terms, saying she was power mongering, power mad, and she was a kind of narcissist. And, you know, you get all this sort of Punch and Judy kind of show going going on. Um, and then other de de defenders of, of her, you know, and Nightingale, you know, you think, what, what would she make of it? She'd be sort of horrified, you know. Um, she didn't ask for all this acclaim. That was not something that she that she actively saw. Anyway, um, just sort of racing through some of these slides, because I want to get to, to, to the sort of further points. Um, I think, you know, it's clear that her legacy has also been laid down in terms of hospital design and specifically uh, for cross-infection, the whole ventilation, the whole, her whole kind of credo of how to create a healthy environment which used the essential elements that were available to put nature, the patient, patient in, in, in the position where nature could act upon it. And she had a very conservative, you know, non-interventionist approach because not surprisingly, that was a pragmatic approach at the time in the, in the mid 19th century to patient care because uh, of course medicine could do probably more harm than good and had actually very little in its kit bag to actually um, add kind of therapeutic efficacy to care. Um, and that whole sense of the hospital environment, the work environment, the practice environment, something I've had the privilege of working in, and it kind of is a huge part of how we think about care today. But that design thinking too, you know, that is working its way, not just into um, how we think about cross-infection, how we measure the cubic meterage between beds, that's something that she stipulated in Notes in Hospital, published in 1863. Um, but also, you know, her kind of, uh, her, her teaching on, on hygiene is, is the standard practice now uh, for, for, um, for COVID today, even though she wasn't an advocate initially of germ theory, eventually she did come round to it believing, of course, she was a contagionist, that infection was, was spread by putrefying, the fumes from putrefying uh, matter. Um, and I think that research, you know, tradition that she pioneered the quantitative element was very much, is very much alive in some of the, the, the workforce research that has been influential in helping to uh, inform legislation for staffing in this country, in Wales and Scotland, and hopefully uh, Northern Ireland and England one day. Come on, Steve, we've got to get moving on that. Um, and uh, also, it's not just numbers, though. It's also the, 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 the quality of uh, nurse 
education and the level at which nurses is educated. And this is a, a resounding kind of endorsement of the, um, you know, I think a lot of the work that the State of the World's Nursing Report has been trying to do, that nursing now is pushing education for nurses. It's the most important investment I think that we can actually make is enough nurses who are well enough educated. And if we start to use even those two variables alone, we can actually impact on patient outcomes and save lives. You know, if we were to uh, lower um, ratios to one to six and have 60% of our nurses educated at bachelor's level, you know, we could save three and a half thousand lives, we reckon, according to our own, our own research. And the role of nursing, I think this is where Nightingale kind of comes into her own because nursing was actually only a relatively small part of her output. She was very much a systems thinker and, you know, a global thinker because she, her thoughts and her work um, transmitted um, across to India, to Australia, in, in being even interested in the, the, the care of uh, Indigenous peoples and Aboriginal children in education, uh, as well as the Indian and army. And um, this role that nurses plays in building health system resilience and, and strength is some, a topic we tackled in a, in a book we published last year, part of um, the European Observatory and WHO Collaborating Centre series. Um, and design principles also have found their way into quality improvement projects, co-design. One of my PhD students was just having a great kind of webinar yesterday with patients around co-designing solutions for a really in intractable problem of um, peripheral neuropathy post-chemotherapy, um, which has been really resistant to any type of uh, of therapeutic intervention. So what 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 works in these most difficult of circumstances? Well, you know, we are applying these principles to try and find out. Clearly, the Nightingale hospitals are the direct kind of heirs, if you like, to the Nightingale hospital legacy and big spaces between beds, inevitably, because a lot of equipment has um, to be uh, hosted there. Um, and I mean, those are in hibernation mode at the moment, thank goodness, because the severity of the surge in the second wave COVID has not been as, um, as dramatic as, as we had feared. Um, but again, I think, you know, taking our lead from Nightingale, where, where do nurses fit in, you know, AI, machine learning, big data? Well, uh, I think she would say we need to be designing these systems and nurses need to be much more at the front end, not just using uh, data that is that is collected and it's often collected by nurses, um, but actually to ensure that the architecture of these data systems are are speaking uh, and 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 flowing into the data flows are, are coming to help us solve nurse nurse related. Uh, problems and that it, there's real. I mean, wouldn't it be magic if we had real time data where we could actually link staffing and, and quality outcomes, you know, in a jiffy like that instead of scrabbling all over and trying to connect these dots up um, in a in a in a much more uh, haphazard and time lagged manner. Um, and again, I think again the the voice of Nightingale as a global leader is being heard through Nursing Now and, and, and other uh, channels through to the World Health Assembly. And I think the positivity of the contribution that we've seen, um, so you're probably seeing all my little emails coming in. I'm going to uh, just, maybe I think I need to do that. Sorry about that. Um, um, is, 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 I think setting setting health global health policy, giving nursing that voice that's amplified by the, the nursing champions, demonstrate how that legacy itself needs to be kind of pulled through and megaphoned out to other international venues. And I think the message from the State of the World's Nursing Report is loud and clear. It's not just you know health ministers we need to be talking to, finance, labour, health, education all of these simultaneously and kind of synchronously 
um, being appraised and educated about what the benefits of, of nursing are in terms of universal health coverage, solutions to some of the major um, SDGs, sustainable development goals. But I just want to say a few words about, you know, that's all very well. And that Nightingale's had huge kind of attention and probably one, one of the, the, the cast of characters in history we know most we know most about, but I'm, I'm, my colleague Anne Summers wrote this great book um, in the 1980s about citizenship and, and military nurses and the role that participation in military campaigns for nurses actually played in helping us to leverage citizenship for nurses. And of course, she didn't quite go up to the end point of that, but some of my own work has looked at this intersection uh, between uh, suffrage and feminist, the early fem first wave feminist movement and registration, which it was a form of kind of, you know, uh, professional uh, emancipation and enfranchisement of the profession. The first wave of a civil rights movement, if you like, giving nurses a uh, vote, a, you know, a role and participation and a voice in setting their own destiny and their own affairs through development of the registration authority and, their, and their, their regulation. So I think these kind of long tales of history find their way through. And I think in Anne Summers' work and also my, my own and um, Siobhan Nelson's, and there's a number of chapters in Notes on Nightingale, which we produced in 2010 for the centenary of Nightingale's birth. We actually look at the pre-Nightingale nurses because, you know, Nightingale didn't build didn't invent nursing. Um, she, you know, she was building on a, a long traditions, much of it religious. And of course, she went to Kaiser, worked to the Lutheran um, pastor Friedners and his his wife's deaconesses uh, institution there. And religious orders, Catholic and Protestant, of course, um, had these long intercontinental uh, traditions across France, across Germany, Belgium. The Begin, and uh, these these European traditions of, of of nursing is really what attracted Nightingale, and this combination of fusing piety, I call it the sort of pietetics of practice, you know, Christian spirituality and uh, hands-on care was really something that that she the synthesis and symbiosis is something that she was very attracted uh, by. Um, it doesn't mean to say that everything that went before, you know, Nightingale was to be demonised and um, and criticised. Far from it. There were very skilled nurses uh, who were working then, and um, um, and not you know not the caricature that, of Sarah Gamp that was used by the the from Martin Chuzzlewit that was used by the reformers to denigrate nursing and of course elevate the status of professional nursing. I mean a lot of these nurses were incredibly skilled and particularly managing infectious diseases, cholera, um, and indeed plague as well as some of the com more common infectious diseases. And of course, you know, we couldn't mention Nightingale without thinking about Mary Seacole, whose magisterial sort of image, you know, now faces the Houses of Parliament um, as, as, no, as no other. And I, I think, you know, again, um, a, a, a huge character. But, you know, again, Mary Seacole comes from a different tradition. She comes from a tradition of Creole indigenous medicine. She was a doctress, first and foremost. That's how she referred to herself. And yet she's been sort of, you know, uh, claimed by others as being a sort of, you know, emblem of a different set of kind of politics and contemporary politics uh, today, and a sort of champion of standing up for a racial and ethnic minority on, on, on rights. And that's that's all well and good. But again, we have to ask ourselves, what would Mrs. Seacole make of all of that? Um, I mean, it's a wonderful, rompy read, wonderful adventures of, of Mrs. Seacole. It's, it's just a kind of a classic, um, in travel literature, as, as, as well as the, you know, the English literature canon. And it's so full of uh, chutzpah and vim and verve. It's, it's an amazing and brilliant and brilliant tale. 
Um, so that's, you know, so I think that, you know, other other research in this in this area, we've got these other traditions, not just, you know, the Creole uh, tradition that links to healthcare and from the you know, from from the, the, the slave trade and in plantations and herbs and healing, you know, that's all part of the nursing kind of tradition, which part of which we've 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 lost. Uh, certainly in Western, westernized um, nursing traditions. Some of that is resurrected and, and unearthed in um, Helen Sweet and Sue Hopkins' work. I've also done some work in, in colonial uh, caring as well, and in particular have wanted to point to the kind of circular migration, if you like, of, and this happened also with Nightingale, the kind of diaspora of the Nightingale disciples going to take up leadership positions in different parts of empire, then eventually setting up schools of nursing, aided and abetted by the colonial uh, administration of, of, uh, of, of the UK, seeding these, these training schools, which in turn become the training schools through which the migration routes back to Britain for the acute shortage of nurses that almost imperiled the very beginning of the National Health Service um, and helped to fill the shortfall in, in nurses, those nurses coming mainly from the Caribbean uh, and the Windrush generation in the first instance. That kind of circular historical process is something that I think, you know, Marxist historians, you know, would have a lot, a lot to talk about. But another work I wanted to refer to um, is, is, and of course that legacy is very much with us today, international recruitment, et cetera, um, is a, one of my favorites and, and great admire historian, South African historian, Shula Marx, race class and gender in South African profession. She makes a point, in fact, Shula was in the archives in Cape Town looking at inequalities in health. And then she stumbled upon a whole group of files on nursing accidentally became an interest and fascinated by it. But there's no possibly greater kind of cleavages of race, class and gender um, than in the South African context, particularly with, with apartheid. And she talks about Bantu nightingales. And that the main and important point I think that she makes is about social mobility uh, for nursing, what nursing represented for black South Africans and, and the way it actually became a vehicle for building a black middle class and one that became actually quite active in the apartheid movement itself. So I think this concern about inequalities, these nurses in communities seeing the, 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 the rampant and rampaging poverty uh, was something which was highly motivating, but nursing was a kind of venue for them to, to become better educated. So this link between nursing and its own social mobility, but supporting perhaps the mobility of others is a sort of reciprocal and a dialectical process. But I think, um, Steve, you have to tell me if I'm going on too long because I can't, <laughs> I can't see my, my slide, my, my watch. Am I, am I okay for time? Um, well, you, we're, we're, well, we're at 10.30, so you've got a couple of minutes more if that's okay, all right. Okay, a couple of minutes, right. Mm. Just a sort of, you know, couple of points, really. I think the, the major lesson that history's taught me is that you just don't get anything without putting pressure on governments or campaigning. Nobody's going to give away power willingly. So you have to take power and often you have to not wait for someone to invite you to the table. So I think that's where, you know, we've been successful in the 1960s pay campaign, you know, nurses might be worried now, 12 and a half percent, that's so much in the current economic climate. Well, Raise the Roof campaign asked for 28% pay rise and they got 22%. So don't be shy and don't be, you know, lured into feeling uh, morally blackmailed and guilty about asking for what is actually a civic and a human right, that nurses should have decent working conditions and be well paid. And again, this just gives you, you know, pay not peanuts. I love this campaign. Students were out there. You know, you just don't get anywhere without taking to the streets and developing 
you know, sophisticated modes of demonstrating. And of course, after 103 years of its history, the college went on, on strike in Northern Ireland. One of the highlights of my presidency was on that picket line. I absolutely loved it to feel that solidarity, the eloquence, articulacy, the determination of those nurses. And whilst the kind of way in which they talked about their passion um, and managing all of this within the parameters of patient safety, it was so impressive. So lessons are inherent in history, but of course, as Hegel would say, it's more difficult to heed and act upon them. And sometimes there are lots of obstacles that do uh, stand in your way, but it does help us understand what the motor and the motivating factors are of change. Um, it helps us also understand the, the conditions that catalyze change, how power works and how it can be harnessed for good. And if any of you have been watching the wonderful Steve McQueen series on BBC One, it's on iPlayer, small act series. Um, it's meant to be a, a pun as well. Uh, the brilliant film about Alex Wheatle, who became a you know, award-winning novelist from really humble and God, traumatic beginnings um, in the 1960s, when he's eventually uh, in jail for crimes that are just not of his making, you know, the racism, just off, just on, it's just horrifying. Um, to which to which he was and his colleagues were were objective, and he ends up with this big you know Rastafarian kind of cellmate you know who's got all of these books of the greats the James Baldwin's you know the civil rights movement and he takes it upon himself to educate Alex you know who's mad about you know reggae kind of music that's his outlet that's his route to freedom that he just finishes part of the film and says you know. If, I'm not going to attempt the Rastafarian accent, you know, uh, you'll be pleased to know. If you don't know your past, you cannot see your future. So the last word goes to Steve McQueen. Great. Thank you, Anne-Marie. Fascinating insights as ever. Um, completely agree on, on, on all your last points there. Um, absolutely spot on. Um, salient point in there on Florence Nightingale not inventing nursing as well. I think that's often betrayed that she uh, that she somehow did, especially in the children's books that I have to read um, read at the moment. Anyway, um, so next up is David Green, who is the director of the Florence Nightingale Museum in London. Welcome, David. Hello there, thank you very much for inviting me. It's nice to be here and nice to be in such esteemed company along with yourself, um, Dame Anne-Marie and um, Greta, of course. Right, yeah, I will just share my screen. Um, Oh, can everybody hear me all right? Yeah, perfectly. Super. Um, it's always nice to be sure, given the challenge that technology can sometimes cause, and we've all been wrestling with, of course, throughout 2020. So, yes, I'm David Green. I'm the director at the Florence Nightingale Museum. It's a role that I've held for about three and a half years now. And to give you just a little bit of background, um, it's, um, I'm not a nurse, I am a museum professional, but I've had to learn quite a lot about nursing, which has been an absolute pleasure the last few years. Very much helped, I should add, by um, both Aunt Marie and Greta, who've always been a constant source of information for me. But I took the role at the museum, largely because it was the bicentenary. I really felt that that gave us something to shout about, to celebrate and to use to really advocate for the nurses of today and the great role that um, they, of course, do, not just in the UK, but worldwide. The second part of my remit was, of course, to actually think about the future as all chief executives effectively do. And the long term plan was very much to think how we could actually transform the museum using the bicentenary, the year of the nurse and midwife, as actually a sort of jump off point to actually move forward. Now, things have turned out a little bit differently to what we expected because of the pandemic, um, but we'll move on to that shortly. 
So then, to start off with, a little bit about the Florence Nightingale Museum, because I'm well aware that ultimately we're quite a small museum. Um, last year we attracted 50,000 visitors. We were hoping to do about 70,000 this year because of the museum. But what we were, crucially, before the museum, um, before the pandemic struck, was a growing museum. Actually, we've pretty much doubled those visitor figures over the last three and a half years and proven that there is a real interest from the public in nursing and from other nurses who very much quite like coming to the museum, partly to meet each other. And I think it's fair to say that we backtracked a broad cross-section of the nursing community. In fact, amongst thousand visitors last year we had nurses from 68 different countries just to give you a clue of the global impact and how much people want to find out about the history of the profession. We're based at St Thomas's Hospital which is of course just opposite Westminster the Houses of Parliament very much a central London venue and whilst we're based there they are actually our landlords and we're a completely independent charity but the reason that we're based there is because historically there's a really nice link to that organisation. We are actually on the very site of Nightingale's first bespoke nursing school. Sadly, not in the actual building itself. I do need to manage the expectation of anybody who visits there. Um, the reason being that that building was destroyed during the war. But I am pleased to say at the far end of the hospital, some of the original pavilions um, designs that were designed by Nightingale do survive. Um, but it's lovely to have that connection and be in that place. Place. Now the museum has about 3,000 items in the collection um, which we fondly call Nightingalia and that can be a whole range of things from letters, books, pamphlets, we all know Nightingale was a prolific writer and about half of our collection is paper based. But the rest can be a whole variety of different objects, um, ranging from items of uniform through to some personal effects that she collected during her life, right the way through to the fact that at the end of her life, we've got her will, um, which again, shows you know, a little bit about what she does. And on the side of my screen there, I've got three objects, which I'd like to just take a moment or two to actually look at. I'm not going to say what they are now at the moment. We'll come back to that later. The reason being that one of the things people like doing when they come to the museum is actually having a bit of a wander around and thinking, what on earth is that? You'll often see in museums a mystery object that sort of challenges your brain to really think what it is. Now, I can't do that today with you, passing it around the room like I sometimes would, because we're doing this virtually. So if you could just look at the pictures instead. Now then, we tell really the warts and all story of Florence Nightingale, I think it's fair to say. Um, certainly, we are advocates for Florence, we're fans of Florence, because she was an amazing woman who achieved some amazing things, as um, Anne-Marie has just shared with you. But we do tell the whole story, um, we try not to duck out of any contentious issues and so on. But we really do believe that what you've got in Nightingale and our sort of personality museum is a very inspiring story. Certainly, we know that um, the museum inspires nursing and healthcare professionals. Our visitor surveys very much tell us that, the feedback that we get to. But again, we remember Nightingale as a statistician, a scientist, a forward thinker. Of course, she's also somebody with a disability, and we work with various disability groups. Um, after she came back from the Crimea, as a lot of you will probably know, she suffered what we now think to be brucellosis and was actually bedridden for a lot of the work that she did. And this year, we particularly worked with the um, ME Society because, of course, a lot of people suffering from ME have similar challenges, not identical, but very similar and found inspiration in our collections and the work Nightingale did. I think it's also good to recognise that Nightingale was just not a conformist. Um, people will sometimes dismiss her as a Victorian lady who certainly had a privileged upbringing. But my word, she threw out the window the, um, the idea that she could conform and follow the typical pattern there. And with her life, she actually turned down a number of marriage proposals, decided instead to say single and work, um, which was almost unheard of for the day, breaking out of the golden cage which society actually 
inflicted upon her. And certainly from a religious point of view, again, she was very much her own thinker, to the extent that while she did believe in God, she was happy to really explore all sorts of different religions and ideas. And actually, she didn't go to church very often, you'll find when you um, come and have a look at her closely, because instead she had her personal beliefs that she followed. And I think what's very much true to say is that she was a female icon, both in her own time and remains so to that day. Consequently, um, a lot of our visitors undoubtedly are female, but it's still a story that does appeal to male audiences too, and that's both from within the nursing profession, but the global tourists too, because undoubtedly that name Nightingale is one of Britain's best exports. Now, while the museum is very much set up to celebrate Nightingale, the story of Nightingale invariably is linked with so many others, and particularly because of the global legacy that she left us and her interactions with other people. As um, Anne-Marie recognised, it's very hard to talk about Nightingale, but not think about Mary Seacole too. I guess that Anne-Marie would use the images we often see, so I've gone there for our Mary Seacole actress. In the same way you can come to the museum and have fun while you learn and meet Florence Nightingale, we also do the same with Mary Seacole too and have some great tales of the Doctress herself and the work that she did. We love working with the Mary Seacole Society and again that's a great opportunity for us to learn and interact with different communities. In the middle there, we've got Ethel Gordon Fenwick, of course, um, championed the idea of the register and particularly a special year um, in her history too. And on the right there, we've got um, Kofurola Pratt, who is rightly regarded as being the first black nurse in the NHS. She studied at the Nightingale Training School, having come from Nigeria, and then went back to Nigeria and actually pretty much established the nursing profession uh, as a profession out there, which I think, again, is a story we're really proud to celebrate because of the links back to Nightingale, but also the wider context of nursing. And we're always happy to look at any stories that we can. And the great thing about the modern world is people are now moving more towards online content because with us being quite a small space it can be challenging to do in the space we had available but history is very important as um, that quote there from Anne Marie says as well as being very enjoyable it can help us make decisions about the future and learn the error of our ways and that all great people you know will have the things they've done wrong as well as the good that they achieved but we're also very much about celebrating contemporary nursing and those contemporary nursing stories. And here I've just got a couple of photographs to actually illustrate that point. On the right hand side, along with our Florence Nightingale actress, we've got our family corner. And that was designed working with the team at St. Thomas's who were really proud to share their stories. And what we wanted to do in that area was really demonstrate the diversity of nursing, both in terms of different roles, but also about the different characters that are involved. And we've got within the St. Thomas's team, a whole range of ages, abilities, national backgrounds, ethnicity, and so on. And it's been lovely to share some of those stories. And the way we've done it is in a very family friendly way, which allows children also to learn about the profession that they may choose to go into in the future. And we've certainly had people visit us that actually report back to us that they're now looking at a nursing career, which is one of the sort of real wins for us when that happens. On the other side, another project we did with St Thomas's, and um, that was when, as a quick response to the pandemic, because so many of our um, activities were cancelled due to problems with gatherings and the like, we actually managed to get permission to illuminate the Houses of Parliament just opposite with some key messages about the history of Nightingale, with thanks to the care workers the world over, and of course Nightingale herself. And it's quite funny, somebody said to me the other day something which I think is very, very true in the fact that having Nightingale all over Parliament is very much probably what Nightingale would have liked, not from the position of 
it grandiose in her name because she was actually very, very shy and preferred to keep a low profile. But the idea of her being all over the politicians and actually being all over all their work, checking what they did and pushing for the advocacy of nursing, I think she would very much approve of. So it was great that we were able to do it in that way. Now I've put at the bottom there, could this be you? Can we celebrate your story? Because whilst those two projects have highlighted, we did with the team at St. Thomas's, who of course are very natural partner to us within the same complex. We do work with all sorts of different nursing organisations. I'm about to begin, for example, a project with Public Health England. Our bicentenary exhibition, we certainly worked with both Nursing Now and the Florence Nightingale Foundation. And we're always keen to hear of people's ideas and what we may be able to do to celebrate the work that nurses do, champion nursing as a career, and actually think how we can influence the future. So we'd love to see you come along to the museum. Um, we're actually closed until January. The reason being that London is so quiet due to the pandemic and we recognise that there is a lot of emphasis on Christmas at the moment, but we'll be back open in January and we're really keen to PT people. So book your tickets online. But if you can't get to us, recognising that this is a worldwide audience we're talking to, why not see our bicentenary exhibition online instead at florencenightingale.co.uk slash 200 exhibits. And you'll see the sort of ways we have involved people with there. We've actually got a pop-up exhibition that we worked on again with a variety of partners. There you'll see um, Colonel Sharon Finley, who's head of British Army Nursing, who was a contributor to that. And we took that to the Chief Nurses Summit, but it's actually going around hospitals in the UK. If anybody wanted the graphics, we can send them out to you. Or you can even now book a Zoom call with our Florence Nightingale actress. And we, she's been involved with various things from awards ceremonies to um, teaching sessions and so on. If you do visit, of course, you may want to get a Florence Nightingale mask, as you can see up there on the right hand side, one of our big sellers this year. And I think people have been buying them to mark the occasion as well as actually for practical use. But lots of ideas there as to how to interact with us. So the answers, I did actually say that we'd come back to those three things I showed you earlier. And the top one, of course, was Nightingale's Lamp. Nightingale's Lamp from Scutari, it um, amazes a lot of people because it's not the genie lamp that you would expect to see, perhaps having seen some of the artwork of the day. It is instead a Turkish fanous because, of course, Scutari Hospital was in Turkey. If you come to the museum, you can find out the fascinating story as to why that's often portrayed in the long way, wrong way. The second one down, which you can see in this image is being held by Chloe, our collections officer, is the Skatari sash, which a lot of people regard as the first item of nursing uniform, um, which Nightingale instigated at Skatari. A fascinating story behind that that I could spend a lot longer than the time we have available here telling you. So um, just have a look on our online exhibition or come to the museum or get in touch with me instead. And then the really tricky one, if anyone got three out of three here, very well done to you. That is, um, it's one of Nightingale's personal effects. It's the Sheikh's pillow. Um, she was one of the first Western women to actually visit Egypt when she went on um, the Grand Tour of Europe, carried on traveling when her parents were trying to persuade her not to be a nurse. And while she was there, she met a lot of influential people and she was gifted this pillow for keeping a woman's posture perfect at night and actually leaning on the back there. It looks a tad uncomfortable to me. Um, I'm not allowed to try it because it's very, very fragile and uh, clearly I'd have a very heavy head and probably destroy it. But again, more about that in our online exhibition. Um, let me know if you've got three out of three. So finally, um, as I mentioned earlier, um, our plans were very much to move and move to bigger premises um, to cope with that growing visitor number. And certainly the pandemic hasn't dimmed our ambition. We still plan to do that in the future. But at the moment, the museum does have a fight for survival on its hands because 
usually we'd welcome visitors from all over the world, those 68 countries that I mentioned. Instead, we've had over 200 days of closure this year. And so um, we're battling for survival like most museums, arts organisations are. If anyone would like to support us, perhaps honour Florence in some way, or just an easy gift for Secret Santa. Please do visit the museum shop. There's all sorts of things in there. Um, some of them just a few pence, ranging to the special Barbie we had done for Nightingale's anniversary on the right hand side. Or again, if anyone is able to make a donation, that would be appreciated. But thank you very much for listening. We hope, and hope to welcome you in some format one day. Thank you very much. Great, thank you, David. Again, fascinating information there absolutely love the artifacts and yes um, please support the museum everyone if you can in any way and now last but by no means least it's Greta Westwood who is CEO of the Florence Nightingale Foundation she's there David you've got to stop sharing your screen work this time There we go. Perfect. Uh, what can you see? Uh, we can see your first slide, I think, which is a picture of you. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. If you press slideshow at the top, Greta, it will just make that one slide bigger. Can you see? Can you see it now? Uh, yeah. So we've got Florence's uh, legacy beyond 2020. Oh, that's. Well, well, we've got we've got one of you, and then. There we go. That's it. Perfect. Is that the full screen now? That is the full screen. Yeah. Oh, marvellous. Thank you. Um, well, good morning, everybody. M thank you very much, Steve and Amory and David. Um, I think I've got a few minutes left before the, the session closes, but my name is Greta Westwood. I'm the chief executive of the Florence Nightingale Foundation. And I want to thank you, the, the, um, the, the panelists today, for inviting me to come along. So um, I just want to say a few things about. Um, the foundation and what it is and what it isn't actually. So uh, I particularly want to talk about Florence's legacy beyond 2020. And um, I really want to talk about um, what is her legacy. You've had some, obviously a lot of that from Anne-Marie this morning and why she's still relevant today, why the foundation should keep her work alive. Um, and I guess my, my premise on all of this is is actually, um, we'll never forget her achievements. And she did so much to advance the professionalism of nursing. And but that was 160 years ago. And, and the memories as you've seen in David's museum are there for everyone to learn. Um, but I guess I, I as Anne-Marie said in that quote, I quickly jotted it down. If you don't know your past, you can't understand your work. And I think that's really true for all the nurses and midwives that come through the foundation. I'm very keen that they do, if they're going to call themselves a Florence Nightingale Foundation Scholar or a nurse midwife, then it's really, it's really important to me that they understand the, the bit about the past. Um, so uh, change, uh, uh, nursing's changed so much after the uh, last 160 years. And um, I'm going to pick up a couple of points that we found, that we identified in our Nightingale 2020 conference. But importantly, um, we're at now this most amazing, highly skilled, educational, uh, educated professional group of nurses. Um, but I really want to concentrate on, on what should we do um, beyond 2020 as a foundation. So um, in 1934, the foundation was created in the UK. And, um, and it was created with a commitment that we must continue Florence's legacy as a living memorial. And again, this picture of Ethel in the center of this screen. So not only did she, was she a, um, an advocate for professional register, but she was the one that um, proposed the, the, the proposal as a living memorial to Florence at the International Council of Nursing in, in 1929. And uh, obviously Florence died in 1910, so it took a few years to work this out, but certainly the, the Florence Nightingale Foundation as it is today in, in Britain is as a consequence of, of what was proposed in 1929. So we've been in existence since 1934 in the UK, and um, we, we absolutely fulfill the commitment to grow and continue her legacy. 
Um, one of the quotes that we use, I think this, this sort of typifies what it is that we do. So when Florence said, when I'm no longer even a memory, just a name, I hope my work will perpetuate the great work that we, of my life. So I guess that's what we've done and, and what we're doing. Um, but actually want to bring you to, 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 to right up to date. So since 1934, the foundation has given opportunities to nurses and midwives um, for scholarships. And our commitment is that, that, that we educate nurses and midwives through our leadership scholarships. We've also had travel and research scholarships. Um, and and these have had, this has had many iterations over, over the last few years. But at the moment, we now, um, and we've done this for a number of years now, there are about 60 leadership scholarships that we award every year. But, but when I came into post, I've just been a chief exec of the foundation for a year. Before that, I was the chief operating officer. And, I, and it occurred to me that um, there are many more people than 60 people that we could have an impact on. So um, we set up with some support from Health Education England at the time and NHS London, a leadership programme for band five and six nurses. So our, our leadership scholarships uh, hap happen to be for the sort of mid to late career nurses and midwives. And I really wanted to develop something that would be for many more nurses at the, at the early stage of their careers. So we set up a programme called, we, you've already heard Anne-Marie talk about the Windrush, but we set up a, a leadership programme for um, uh, 17 nurses and midwives who potentially were descendants from the Windrush generation and 70 being the year um, that uh, we celebrated NHS 70 and also um, the uh, 70 years since the Windrush generation came to the UK. So that was, uh, that was a, a great success. Health Education England had carried on funding that programme and NHS London wanted to support 70 nurses and midwife, midwives across all uh, London organisations. So that was our blueprint for our leadership programmes and we've developed many more since then across multiple specialties and groups of nurses and midwives. So um, that's really the, the, the essence of what we have been doing and what we are doing. Um, but I, I think bringing you up to date with what's happened during COVID. So uh, um, COVID happened for us on the 16th of March. We, as David said, this is the bicentenary of Florence Nightingale's um, birth. And we had many, many um, uh, programs, events, sorted lots of fundraising organizers lots of fundraising events arranged but unfortunately we just couldn't do any of them and we really needed to think on our feet what could we possibly do we're a very small organization at the time we were seven people um, um we had to i had to slim that down to uh, by 50 percent um during during the lockdown um, but I wonder, all the three through um, the lockdown, I've always wondered what Florence would do and say about what it is um, that's been presented. And as Amory said, you know, we've heard and we've had, had different interpretations of the data. But this was some latest data I picked up from the WHO um, website, their, their dashboard about the number of infections and the number of people who've died. And our Nightingale 2020 conference was in October. And this here is a, um, is a headline of um, one of our presenters, um, Howard Caton, who's the chief exec of the ICN. And he presented a slide that said, COVID nurse death toll may be as high as, is now as high as the number of nurses who died during World War I. And a number of organizations and, and press picked this up. And uh, uh, it's certainly something I've written about in the early days of lockdown, particularly about the disproportionate amount of nurses and midwives from a BAME background who had died. And I think Florence would be banging on number 10's door um, with this data. And uh, you know, this, this isn't for us to, to, um, to leave behind. This is something that we need to keep hold of. And today marks the first day that um, a person, one person, the first person across the world is being vaccinated against COVID-19. And I would like to think that COVID and all her, um, all her protégés have, uh, will be banging the desk and, and waving the flag and the data to suggest that nurses must be vaccinated as a, as a priority to save the, um, the nursing and midwifery professions. 
So um, COVID happened, we couldn't do a thing. Our, our events were all canceled. Our biggest event of the year is Westminster Abbey, where we celebrate Florence's birth date on the 12th of May. We have two and a half thousand people who come to that event. Obviously, well, that was almost the first thing that I canceled. Um, I went back to, as, a, as I did a, another of my colleagues, I went back to work in the NHS for two days a week, every week for two months, hence my photograph earlier on in my, my red uniform. Um, but actually that wasn't, uh, not, I, I felt I couldn't sit at home and, and not do nothing because I was the chief exec as a foundation, but I wanted to support nurses and midwives. And we couldn't deliver any of our programmes, but what we very, very quickly did, and this plays into um, the Nursing Times campaign, is we developed a programme called the Nightingale Frontline Leadership Support Service, which essentially is a, is a virtual, it's a remote service that nurses and midwives can book onto, um, and it provides a co-consulting session for six nurses or, and or midwives facilitated by a, a skilled facilitator. And, um, and helps has really helped them through some of the early days and, and certainly now picking up again um, of COVID-19 and what that meant um, to nurses across the whole career pathway. We have created a, an animation of it, um, of some of our early findings and that's on our website, hence the little diagrams on the left-hand side. Um, but actually, in the uh, what we've identified now is some some key themes that have come out of that, and the nurses and midwives were telling us. And I, whilst this was a remote service, I provided this as a face to face service in my local NHS organisation, and I do have a notebook um, filled with um, some of their their stories, their, the narratives that they told me. But the, the, there are some themes that have come out and, and really the overriding theme is the theme of courage. And what people were describing to us is that they needed, um, there were six themes under courage and, and the first one is to be authentic, to have the courage to be authentic in this time, to be tra transparent and tell the truth and how to lead through uncertainty. This was really shocking in the early days, but was uh, clearly got better as time went on. And the challenge to, the, the courage to challenge. I think some nurses and midwives felt that there was a top down and quite rightly in a crisis, the management situation had to be that there had to be command and control. But some of those found that particularly challenging and they needed the courage to challenge when they felt that they knew the answer. Um, and the challenge to, and the courage to role model, this was a time they'd never experienced this before. They didn't know how they needed to be, but they certainly needed to be a role model for, their, for, for others in their team. And the courage to communicate, to absolutely tell the truth. So um, we are involved in some other studies, which Amory knows about, the ICON study, the impact of coronavirus on nurses. And, and some of those results will be available soon. Um, but it, we really wanted to support the front line and, and this service is, is still carrying on. We've seen 1500 nurses and midwives go through the service and we absolutely knew, no, that it was vital to, to their survival in, in, uh, at that time. Um, I know Barbara Stilwell is here and if anybody else was our 2020 conference, um, one of the big themes that picked up was, was actually, um, let's be proud of what we did. We are very thankful thankful that everybody stood outside and clapped and said thank you NHS healthcare, uh, healthcare workers. Um, but actually one of our, our, our um, speakers at our conference used the phrase, let's lose the narrative. We're not superheroes, but we're highly skilled, educated and trained professionals. And whilst it was nice to hear this and, and accept the applause, it's actually quite um, difficult to hear sometimes and the bottom photograph absolutely describes how difficult and technical nursing has become and um, I, I think collectively we could do a campaign about losing the voice. It's nice that the public think this about us but actually we're more than um, angels with wings. Um, one of the things that we have um, are, are, are with so I've told you about what, what is we've been doing over the last um, 70 odd years, but this is about um, what we're going to do in the future. So we launched the Florence Nightingale Academy at the end of September, and this is available for all chief nurses across the healthcare sectors across the UK to join on behalf of their nurses and midwives. And the information is available on our website. 
But importantly, now we've got this model and we understand the benefits, we can we absolutely know that this is a model that we can um, um, uh, uh, have have across the world. So we, we are next year we'll, we'll open this to um, international partners so that they too can become members of the Florence Nightingale Foundation Academy. Um, uh, this was just to show that we do have interest across the world and that was a map that we used in our conference where we showed that where all the delegates came from. Um, and I'm very keen that we have so many nurses and midwives that go through our leadership programmes and our scholarship programmes. One of our key themes is to shine a light and always shine a light and celebrate the work that we do. And we, of course, we've got our um, professional press, et cetera, to do this for, for us. But we, we're we really, now I'm actually, in, um, now we've all understood technology a bit better, we can use podcasts to do this. So um, shining a light on Kendra, she she was a band six nurse working in um, St. Thomas, uh, guys in St. Thomas's, and she applied for our Windrush leadership, leadership programme. And all of our um, nurses and midwives on our programmes always do a quality improvement project. So they show some impact that their leadership has had on, on their journey through our programme. So her project was, um, she worked in homeless health. She I had identified that only 62% of a um, 25 to 40, 49 year old women had cervical screening. And this was about 16% less than the expected standard. And the reasons that people clearly, if you're homeless and not picking up cervical screening is they're not registered with a GP or not necessarily registered with a GP. They're not on a national database anywhere. Um, they haven't a permanent address, so you can't send invitation letters. And, and one of the things that they don't do is they prioritize their appointments. So her project was to um, find these women and offer cervical screening to them. And her project was about how, to, how she did this and, and what, was the, what was the impact. So in three months, she went out and found 42 homeless women in refuges, hostages, uh, hostages, hostages, host, what are they called? Host, anyway, that word. Um, she, and uh, hostels, that's the word, on the streets. And she used adverts throughout outreach workers. And uh, she, she, with a small, I mean, there was no involved, money involved. This was part of her day job, but she did this in addition. And she, but she, she absolutely made a difference to those women. And they now on a database, the difficulty is obviously following them up, but she knows that that was totally possible to do. So really, what about the future? What about beyond 2020? Um, and as David said, everyone said, this year has promised so much, but in reality, it put a pause on all the events and importantly, it put pauses on people's lives. And so, sadly, uh, across the world, we've seen about 1.5 million lives have been lost. So for me, I want the foundation to be a household name. Um, I, I want to work, we work so well in the UK now that I want to spread our work globally. And our, our future work, my, my ideal is that the future work should be around supporting nurses and midwives to de deliver some of the WHO, WHO health related um, SDGs. We must continue to sh shine a, a light on, on the work that we do and the, uh, through, our, through our programs. Some of our nurses and midwives go on to become chief nurses, CNOs, um, certainly in, in England and Northern Ireland, they were, ex, they were scholars of the foundation. Um, and we, shining the light also means for me, increasing the leadership capacity for nurses and midwives that come from a BAME background. And that's really important to the foundation. Last year, we started um, developing nurses and midwives as digital scholars. This year, we, we have those out at Advert again. And, and this really is picking up on Florence's legacy, how we use big data to, trans, trans, um, to, to, to deliver um, uh, better patient care and, and show the impact. So um, my view is uh, that we haven't shown a photograph of Florence in bed today, although we have seen her bed or a bed, um, but actually she achieved so much from her bed. When she came from that, back from the Crimea, she hardly, she did get out, but hardly at all. But actually if she can do it from her bed and we've all been working from home, um, I, my, I would suggest that we can do this too. There's a lot of work to do. 
Um, and Florence's work is definitely in the history books. It's really important that nurses and midwives understand from where they've come, but there's so much more to do. Um, and I really want to suggest that the Florence Nightingale Foundation is now not just for the few, but it is for the many, not only in the UK, but across the world. Um, I want to thank you for listening. Great, thank you very much, Greta. Uh, I think some of your points around the perception of nurses and how it differs between the profession and the public's particularly interesting. I think that's going to be a, uh, an interesting one um, for the future. Um, right, so thank you to our panel. We've now got time for some questions. So audience, uh, please send anything in you want to ask. Um, basically, you do use the chat function, which is uh, it's on the right hand side of my screen. I'm, I think it may move around depending on um, how you've got your screen set up. But basically, um, just type something in there. Um, so in fact, we've already had one question in from Pat Hughes who asks, I think this is one for Greta, what's the relationship between the FNF and the FNIF? And how does this impact on global plans? Um, oh, okay. Is that, is that one you know about? Yes, I do I happen to do. So um, very good question. Um, so the, I, the FNIF was set up, um, so it originated from the same call of, of um, the ICN conference in 1929. And uh, the ICN have been, this is a, a, a small branch of, of their work, but uh, they, they have some um, star projects that they, that they um, fund through that, that particular work. One of them is the uh, education for orphaned children for orphan children of nurses and midwives across the world. So there is a connect, the connection is, I work with, with Howard Caton very well. Um, they have, the, they have the international FNF uh, and our foundation is an offshoot of that as, as there were some other offshoots across the world um, in the early days. I'm not absolutely certain how many, maybe our Marinos, but I'm not absolutely certain how many other original uh, committee, Florence Nightingale Memorial Committees they were called, um, uh, 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 survive. But certainly I, I, I obviously know the one in the UK best. So thank you, hopefully that answered that question. Great, thank you very much. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, onward. So John Gilmore, um, and he uh, he says, always a pleasure to listen to Professor Rafferty. Thank you. Um, so I think this is one coming for you, Anne Marie. Um, and he says, I'm interested in your thoughts on um, accusations that Florence Nightingale was was racist, classist, and in an era of us being more conscious of these issues, whether we should be talking about this. Uh, rather than focusing solely on her positive influence on health systems. Um, so yes, uh, tasty question there. <laughs> yeah, thank you, John. I mean, I, I don't know what exactly these accusations are um, in relation to race and, and class. I mean, certainly uh, Nightingale was from an upper middle class family but I mean she was so empathetic towards people in poverty and I mean in fact her, her initial I think her very first work uh, was really in the poor law sector so I think she identified a lot and she did you know when she was growing up um, there's there's lots of stories about her doing outreach if you want to call it that um, into her own community and looking after the poor, the poor villagers and, and their, their well-being and their welfare. So I think she had this very strong identification with people who were suffering and suffering was something that really tormented her. I think maybe that's not even too strong a word to use. Um, and I think see, uh, David alluded to her personal kind of spirituality and she had really complex views on religion and spirituality uh, very what I call syncretic she drew from lots of strands of religious thoughts so I'm, I, I don't recognize the, the, the class the classist here and I'm not sure what she's supposed to have said and I think we should judge people by what you know by what they say as well as what what they do in terms of you know, racism, and I think we've seen a huge kind of explosion of um, concern about racism and in history, you know, with the 
uh, I guess the almost the weaponizing of, of history uh, to make certain points, the, the de demolition, the, the throwing of statues into, into, into docks and with the Black Lives Matter uh, movement itself. I'm not saying, I'm not criticizing that at all. I think it reflects the passion, the fervor and the ferment of the anger that is boiling inside some you know, people about the historic injustices. And, you know, I think that's something that, that we, we deplore what happened in the past and that legacy of suffering and, and pain, I think is still working through its way through society to, today. And, you know, this is not something that's only impacting obviously Britain or the United States. Um, the Democratic Republic of Congo and its relation, vexed relationship with Belgium and Leopold II and the atrocities that were actually um, committed by a man who never even set foot on African soil and ruled an empire as was, you know, the, the, from, 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 from Brussels, the, the comfort of his own palace. I mean, you know, these, these, these are all points of convulsion, I think, in which history um, draws us kind of into these great debates. And I, I think we just have to be wary. Um, I'm not defending anyone historically, but of thinking about the standards by which and reflect upon the standards by which we make any of these judgments. Um, and what other choices were available to people at, at, at the time. But um, I, I, you know, I, I, I think it's, it, it, it's right that we should, be, we should be protesting today. And history is playing a massive part in raising people's consciousness as well. But you know, we live in a, a, an information kind of era where, you know, there can be a lot of demonizing and perhaps misinformation about what happened in the past as well as you know positivity and I, th I think um, that you know I would just I would just sort of want to hear uh, this as a historian I'd always want to go back to the original sources the oracular sources themselves and, and make judgments on, on 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 those on those grounds and are we in the court of you know as historians, are we are we sitting in, in, in a courtroom judging the people of the past? Well, I think that's a moot point and one that we could continue to discuss. Oh yeah, undoubtedly, undoubtedly. Um, David, did you want to say anything about how the museum sort of has to tackle, um, you know, things like the, the the way the past is portrayed and 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 the current, uh, you know, the way things are a bit different now? Putting you on the yeah, spot certainly. there slightly. Yeah, I mean, I think that Anne-Marie summed up very well that, I mean, it's one of the, the biggest challenges you face as a historian, and that's what my academic background um, actually sort of is, is that judging people by the standards of the day, it's certainly not excusing those standards, but it's certainly, I think, about getting an understanding, having compassion, and having reasoning um, behind any decisions that were made. And whilst as I said, the museum is very much about telling a warts and all story and none of us are perfect in any way. But what I would say is that I think some of the saddest days that we sort of ever have is sometimes when you'll have a school group come in and a child will put their hand up partway through the um, session with um, Florence Nightingale and say, so was Florence racist? And we'll sort of be able to unpick that a little bit with them about what that means and so on. And it's often linked to the Mary Seacole story and the fact that popular opinion is sometimes that Nightingale abruptly told Seacole to her face she wasn't going to the Crimea. And there's no historical fact for that. Florence had left some months beforehand. And I think with any story, we all know, it's always very easy for different versions to get out. And it's become almost a little bit of a, a whisper of what, and then people embellish and so on. And 
I think all I'd say on this one is that having read many of the works, by no means all of them, and so on, I think that if you look at Nightingale, she had a 90-year lifespan and a career over 50 years. And like most of us during our life, you see that her opinions change, she matures, she reflects. And earlier on, some of you may have picked up when I made the um, sort of small joke about her being all over Parliament. And one of the ways she was certainly all over Parliament was actually about the treatment of the people, um, the British subjects in India. And by that, I mean, the Indians. Gandhi um, very much has Nightingale at the top of his list of people that he admires because she fought so hard to actually improve the rights of ordinary people in India at the lowest level of the um, sort of ch economic chain. So I think in that example alone, we very much get back to Anne-Marie's point that she struggled with actually seeing anybody suffer in any way and so on and I could give a lot more examples too I won't because of the clock and I'm by no means here to be an apologist for anything the other thing in the context of Black Lives Matters is that I'm really proud to be able to say that Nightingale of course was from an abolitionist family her and um, if you look at actually her family tree they've been opposing slavery for a long long time and None of their money, um, whereas so many museums at the moment are really scrutinising their collections, working out where they've got them, what they've got to repatriate. Nightingale, I'm really, you know, thankfully able to say we haven't got you know, that crisis to deal with because actually their money came from the lead mines, etc. And they're known from within the Derbyshire area in particular for looking after the local community and the workers too. Great, thank you very much, uh, everybody. Um, so here's a question from me, which I guess is probably an obvious one. Um, I'll probably, I'll get um, Greta to, to go first. Um, basically, looking at 2020, um, will it go down as a significant moment in the history of nursing? Um, presumably it will. Uh, and if so, how will it be remembered or how should it be remembered, do you think? Well, um, I, I guess the first thing to say is the WHO have declared an extension to 2020, uh, the year of the nurse and midwife into 2021. So um, for certain, all, all of the things, um, all of the celebrations that everyone was planning to do this year uh, to celebrate her anniversary will be happening and continuing to next year. I, I, from, a, from a nursing point of view, a midwifery point of view, is it, it will be a, an historical moment. It is an historical moment. They'll, I'm, I'm sure our, 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 the people beyond us in 50 years time will be saying, look about the look at this book that Amory wrote about nursing during COVID, during a pandemic. Uh, it's quite interesting to, to, to read about the, the Spanish influenza mm. at the end of the First World War and some of the similarities there. So I, I, I think there's a compare and contrast, but, 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 but for certain, um, I, I think that we, there are many stories that we, we do need to publish and, and tell over the, over, as a result of 2020. Um, it, 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 it's 2020 will be, go down in history as, as the bicentenary, but the year that nurses and midwives um, really shone and um, I'm, Unfortunately, uh, unfortunately, but unfortunately, the public saw a, um, an esca escalated put on on a on a on a on a plinth the, the role of the nurse and midwife like they've never experienced before. So, uh, in, in that respect, it's grain it, 2020 for nurses and midwives is is done a huge amount for the professions. Um, but I would like us to see that strength and use it to take us on. To the next 50 years what can we do with this the information that we've got now about nursing during covid um and and how how do we extrapolate that into redefining the professions um doing stuff that we've never done before but we can do now using remote medicine telemedicine um, technology, um, digital data, all of those things that we thought that we'd never do and the, and obviously there is more more healthcare organisations than the NHS, but using the NHS as an example, 
um, the things that were able to be turned around during this time have been phenomenal. And I think that we that those will be the stories of celebration as uh, we will have beyond 2020. Great, thank you. Um, so Anne-Marie, sort of, sort of similar um, question to you, but also just adding in a couple, because uh, we've had Pat Hughes has asked, what would Nightingale say about nursing today? And, and what would her advice be on, on the country on, on to ensure that the contribution um, presumably during COVID was uh, rewarded and acknowledged? Um, and, and Barbara uh, from Nursing Now has asked whether whether you think that Florence Nightingale would have supported the Nursing Now campaign. Um, so there we go. Um, so sorry, quite a few points there I put to you. Um, to me. Yeah, is that all right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, Steve. Yeah. Um, so what would Nightingale say about nursing today? Yeah, I think she'd be pretty impressed uh, and pleased that nursing, at least in this country, and of course it is definitely uh, also apparent in many European countries, but it's by no means exclusive, but it is by and large a, a graduate profession, as Greta, Greta has, has said. I think she was definitely a believer that nurses should be well well trained um she might be of course she would probably applaud the fact that infection control was uh, at the forefront of what we are tackling today and to perhaps to see many of her precepts still as relevant but i i think she would be uh horrified by some of the challenges that we've had to face in uh the logistics around access to PPE, for example. I know Greta's heard me railing on this topic before as, as well. And, and there's no doubt in my mind that she would have been beating that hasty trail down to number 10, hammering on the door and insisting and seeing Boris Johnson and saying, move over, darling, I'm in charge. And she, because logistics was what she was really, really good at. So I think she would want to make sure that she was at the heart of that operation, as David said, you know, being all over Parliament and orchestrating things and being um, having her, you know, colleagues at the centre of all of the key expert decision making bodies from SAGE and all of its Christmas tree type committees and lobbying the health committee, lobbying the Public Accounts Committee, lobbying the National you know, Audit Office. She would be on it like a rash. And I don't think she'd be standing back waiting for anyone to invite her either. So I think you know, she'd be making uh, probably her presence felt um, and insisting on us having excellent data um, to, the, to the fore and data systems with which to put evidence-based policy slash um, clamorous complaints to the government and putting the government under intense pressure. And she wouldn't just be talking to the government, she'd be talking to the opposition as well and giving them ammunition. So I think I think that's what she would be she would be doing. Um, and that would be part of her kind of critique. And that's what we should be doing. We should, I think we should be really ramping it up and ramping up the voice, the voice of nursing, the volume. Um, pumping up the volume, as it were. So, is there another wee thing in there? Um, oh, no, that, that, that's fine. I think we. Yeah. Is that all right? Yeah. yeah. No, great. It's a, it's a wonderful image uh, of uh, yeah, the idea of Florence Nightingale in in Downing Street hammering on the on number ten. That'd be good. Yeah. Um, right. Okay. So we're pretty much out of time there. Um, so that was all, all perfectly on 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 the on the money there. Right. Right. Finished at half eleven. So should all be good um so fantastic uh, thank you very much to Anne marie david and greta uh, again thanks very much um for taking part um and thanks to nursing now for putting on the event and asking me to chair it and thank you audience as well for watching and taking part um i think if you missed it it's been recorded so you'll be able to watch it back um but thank you very much and goodbye thank you thank you bye bye and for your questions bye <laughs>